for the introduction and, and hosting and having me today. And thank you everybody else for joining. And I'm really happy to be again with you, Singapore Joke. And uh, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to see you again face to face. Now, let me. Sh oh, I think uh, Michael, you are yes. sharing. Uh, yeah, we okay. I was looking for the button. Sorry, fun. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Okay, so where are the slides? Here we go. Now, let's play this. All right, so we have about uh, 60 minutes or so. And uh, so I know it's a little bit delayed uh, where you are. I'm streaming directly from Switzerland, and it's a little bit past my midday, so lunchtime, but for you guys, we'll be very close to the dinner time. So um, I will encourage you to ask questions um, anytime you, want, you feel like and uh, on the chat. And uh, Michael, if you could please do me a favor and let me know whenever a question is raised. I will do my best to answer as quickly as possible. If not, they will still have time at the end uh, if you still have any questions. So uh, the topic of today, Maven. What I wish I knew about Maven years ago. So what's going on here? So as Michael said, my name is Andres, and uh, I work for Oracle. I'm a Java champion, and I created um, an event called Hackagot, which is a series of um, meetings where people come after hours and work on open source projects just because we love open source. And that's pretty much it. So when I was in college, and this is back in 2000, and not even 2000, this is 1995, Java came out. And I was one of the first students that asked my professor at the time was uh, we were learning in C and C++. I asked if I could do my final project in Java instead of C++. And since then, I never looked back. So, of course, um, Java was uh, based on, on a, an idea as to present a syntax that's very close to C and C++ to allow the vast majority of developers to jump into the platform. Now, because it was just emerging, there was no build tool per se in Java. We only had the compiler. So as, as time progressed and uh, projects started to grow in complexity, it was needed. It, 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 it came very apparent that a uh, build tool was actually needed. And we only had access to Make at the time. And if you ever have worked with Make and C and C++, you know that there is some sort of portability, portability but it was, it, it's still a bit difficult. And uh, it's not the same thing as in Java, where you have one language that can work in different platforms. Because of this, a project emerged called Apache Ant. And this project was created in order to build Tomcat, which was one of the first major open source projects in the Java space. And uh, just because everybody was happy with XML at the time, well, you have to use an XML descriptor for int. The advantage of int is that it gave, it gave us a portability. Uh, it gave us a descriptive DSL based on XML to define anything that you need to. And that's a little bit also part of the double-edged sword that you can define and you can do anything you want to or need to, which meant that your project will be perhaps very, very different from another project for another team, another colleague, another organization, or a completely different company. So moving from one project to the next was a little bit difficult. Despite this, projects continue to grow, and they grew so much that the need for another build tool uh, arose, and that's how we got into Maven 1. So Maven 1 took the uh, lessons learned from Ant and gave us uh, dependency resolution. So no longer have you had to commit your jar files or dependencies into source control. You can rely on, on some metadata files and external service, as Maven Central, to download and configure the dependencies. But it also gave us a project structure, convention of a configuration, and a few other things. And, and that's how uh, the, uh, the Java ecosystem exploded, because they allow us to really build projects at a much bigger scale. And sometime later, in I think it was around 2007, uh, a couple of people figured out that maybe Maven wasn't what they really needed because Maven, jumping from Maven 1 to Maven 2, the structure was more constrained. Uh, things were or appeared to be fixed or more or stricter. So these people said, we want to have more flexibility. It's not enough for my project to be bent to the tools wheel. I want it the other way around. I want the build tool to be bent 
to what my project requires. And that's how we got Gradle. And for this reason, some people believe that Gradle is just like Ant, where you can do whatever you want, which is true, and you don't have to use an XML DSL. You use a programmatic uh, DSL, which you originally was based on the Groovy programming language. Now there are two. If you are familiar with Kotlin, you can also use Kotlin. And uh, at least at this time in 2008, where I jumped from Maven to Gradle. Why? Because I didn't want to deal with the XML. I thought Maven was just a simple tool that was wrapped around with XML, and it was quite done. Actually, that was not true. In 2010, Maven 3 came out. By that time, I had already jumped into Gradle. I didn't look back into Maven. And that was my mistake. Because, as it turns out, there are really good features, there are really neat features in Maven that are similarly provided in Gradle, or there are even features that are not available in Gradle that are really good to have. And for this reason is why I decided to come back to Maven and have a hard look into what this build tool actually is and what you can do with it. So I'm sure that you have, may have seen some of the features I'm going to discuss today. There may be some others that will be completely new to you. So uh, we'll see how it goes. And again, let me remind you, if you have any questions at any time, please let me know. And English is not my native language. If, when I get very excited uh, about topics, I start to speak faster and faster and faster. So you please also let me know if I should just slow down a little bit. So the first thing is um, override project properties. Now you may define project properties in a couple of ways. Mm, you may have seen that you can define properties using a properties block on the POM file, or properties may be defined by plugins. Actually, every parameter of a plugin, in this case, a mojo, a mojo is the, uh, the thing that actually runs and reacts to the lifecycle from Maven. Uh, the, every, every parameter that is annotated uh, will expose automatically some sort of project property that can be overridden if needed be. Now you can also define and override properties on the command line using the minus D keyword and key value. Now this is pretty cool because it doesn't matter how the property was defined, uh, then you may be able to set some values. Now let me show you a quick demo of this. So let's jump into the terminal and uh, I have, I think, let me see, a couple of projects. Let's jump into properties, this is fine. Right now, let's see uh, which version of Maven I have. I think it's dash dash version. And um, this is latest version of Apache Maven 363 with Java 1.8 update 191. So that's not the latest, it still is Java 8. Great. So now let me show you a simple POM file that I have here. Uh, it has the, the group ID artifact in version uh, coordinates. These are known as GAV coordinates. And uh, just a simple dependency. And the source code, I think, uh, just make me sure that I, there's nothing up my sleeve, so everything is clean. I do a tree here, and I only have a simple file, uh, class like this. And if I display the source, it's supposed to be a simple application that can be run. So far, so good? Okay. Now, remember, I'm using Java 8. So if I'm to compile this code and I say something like maybe compile, then uh, tells me a few things. Yeah, it builds perfect. Now, let me inspect the compile code. So that's minus B, minus B, minus C, targets. Uh, no, nope, not that one. Uh, classes. Sample class, and let's look at the head. Major version happens to be 49. Does anyone want to take a guess which major version of that maps to Java? That's right. That's Java 5. So what's going on here? So Maven by default has some defaults, and uh, the base uh, compilation value for, for uh, target and source is set to Maven 5, uh, to Java 5. So there are ways that we can override this or set the defaults. Um, you can define in the POM file the, the entry for the Maven compiler plugin and put uh, the source and the target. You may use the properties block to define just Maven compiler target and Maven compiler source 
Or you can also do it in the command line by just doing this, maven compiler targets. Let's, do, let's make sure that it's clean and then do compile, right? Oh, sorry, uh, my mistake, I didn't define a body and Maven told me, pretty good. So there we go, Maven compiler target 1.8, clean compile. And then we look again until on the decompiled bytes code and happens to be major version number 52. So this is Java 8 now. Now, every other property that is exposed by plugins or your point files can be overridden in the command line like this. Um, okay, let's go back to the slides. So the next one, and this is a pretty neat feature, is that you may invoke any plugin on a project by passing the gap coordinates and the goal and any additional parameters that the goal may need for its execution. Now, um, for example, say that there's the echo plugin and you want to execute it. Uh, the echo plugin will require the group ID, um, which is ComGitHub Echo with Echo Maven plugin. The artifact ID is Echo Maven plugin, version number 120. And the goal that we want to invoke is echo, and we pass a parameter. Now, because we're doing an invocation in line, that makes great that we can override parameters using the command line. Otherwise, we will have to modify the POM file to provide, say, parameter. If we already modify the POM file, then it might make sense to apply the plugin. So this will defeat the purpose. Um, I can show you a quick demo of this. And uh, I believe in this particular project, I have a couple of commands. So let's see, command number one. It looks like this. So I'm going to execute, uh, I can execute the exec Maven plugin to run the application. And uh, this will compile exec and notice that it passes an argument for the main class. If we didn't do this, then it will be a failure. So I can do this by passing the command to the shell and let's see what happens. It compiles, it builds, and we get hello world as a result. Right there, we can see it. Good. Let's see, I have another command. Oop, not that one, like this. Notice that this will be the same thing, uh, executing the code, but uh, particularly exec, and there's a, a subset of plugins that Maven is aware of, especially those that have a, a very specific group ID, which is uh, the Oracle Apache Maven and the Mojo House uh, group IDs. If those plugins are found in those group IDs, then you can simply define the name of the plugin, not the artifact ID, but the name, which is part of the plugin descriptor. And the goal in this case will be exec job. So if I am to invoke this command, pass it to the shell, I should get a hello world output again, which is true. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm executing an inline plugin passing parameters. Now let's look at the last one. I think this is the actual invocation of the hello world. And uh, just to be sure that there is nothing fishy here, I'm going to copy this right there. And let's do maven, the gap coordinates plus the goal, which is echo, then define echo message with a value, hello Singapore from Switzerland. And then we get hello Singapore from Switzerland. And that's pretty much it. This works for pretty much any project any plugin you find out there. All right. So next one, dependency resolution, which is uh, one of the reasons why many people jump from Ant or Make or something else into Maven. Now, dependency resolution is pretty great, but it has, um, it has some rules that many of us, including myself, may not be aware and uh, things it will result in, in some interesting things that we'll see in just a moment. So basically, you define dependencies in a dependencies block. That's the first case. 
And if you have a hierarchy of palms, uh, say that you have the palm and the parent and the grandparent all the way to the super palm, you can have a many dependencies blocks. The dependencies block on your palm, the one that you're currently compiling, it's the one that wins over everything else that is found on the hierarchy. Now, when you define explicit dependency in this block, this dependency has precedence over everything else. These are known as direct dependencies. So if you have, let's say, guava explicitly defined in your palm or in a parent file, and then you find guava somewhere else in the dependency graph brought by another dependency. This will be known as a transitive dependency. It doesn't matter what version of that guava is in transitive. The direct one will always win. And if it's, um, if it's a transitive dependency, then the rules are different because maybe we'll look at the location of the, of the dependency in the graph how many hops it has to go from your current palm to reach that dependency. And the one that requires the less hops, it's not the version number, but the one in the location that is closest is the one that is going to win. And this is one thing that stumbles a lot of people. So let me show you quick, uh, something very quickly. Uh, back in March, I ran a quest on dependency resolution with movement. It was just 14 questions that seem uh, quite simple. So let me show you the first one. I only really show you two of them. The first question says, say that you have a palm file like this one that defines two dependencies and those dependencies happen to be guava, so same group ID and artifact ID, but different version of them. So if I were to resolve dependencies with dependency tree, which version will be the selected one? Is it going to be 21, 27 because it's the first? This is going to be 28 because it's the latest, or this is the last defined, or this is going to be a build error because, well, duplicate dependencies, right? That should be a problem. Well, if you run dependency tree on a project that is defined like this, turns out that Maven does output a warning, which is right there on the top that says, uh, I'm not so sure about this one. You have a duplicate dependency here, 27 and 28, but I'm going to allow it. Why? Because Maven says, I'm going to resolve the last one, version 28. Now, surprisingly, 36% of the people that answered the, 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 the questionnaire, which was a bit more than 500 people, they said this turns out to be a build error. Actually, it's not. So here's question five. You have two dependencies, two direct ones, uh, truth and juice. Both of them have guava as transitive dependency in one hub. Juice depends on guava 25. And um, truth depends on guava 27. So which one is going to be the selected version when I resolve this? Is it going to be version 25? because juice is first, or is it going to be version 27 because truth is second, or is it going to be a builder? Well, turns out the answer is version 25. Why? Because juice is the first one. This is a transitive dependency. Guava 25 is found first in the graph, and that is the chosen version. So let me show you a quick demo of this, and uh, let's go back to the terminal. I think I have uh, this example, transitive one. And uh, so here's example. So this is juice and truth in this order. So if I were to resolve dependencies, which by the way, the dependency plugin is not applied by default. It's not even coming from the Maven super pump. So by just defining dependency tree, I'm going to invoke an inline plugin. And because dependency is part of the core plugins, I don't have to specify the gap coordinates. Here we go. Maven dependency results in Guava 25, just as we saw in the slides. So what happens if we invert the order and we define truth and use second? 
Um, let's go to this one. Uh, that pump. There we go. So now truth is first, juice is second. If I do a dependency tree, what's going to happen? The selected version is now Guava 27. Again, because it was found first and it's the nearest to the pond that you're currently executing. Hmm. Okay. So this debunks one of the myths that people have when encountering Maven, which is, oh, I, my project uses semantic version. My dependencies also use semantic version. So if I put everything correctly with semantic versioning, then Maven will resolve all the latest versions of dependencies, right? It doesn't matter where they are in the graph. Well, that is not true. And this is what May, uh, Robert Schulte, the Apache Maven PMC chair, had to say about the current state. Maven never looks at the version number. Mm -mm. It only looks at the location in the graph. Now, this decision was made many years ago. And it may be the case that uh, this decision has to be reevaluated with the current times. Now, if you really need or if you really want uh, semantic versioning rules for the resolving dependencies, then you should have a look at the Maven Enforcer plugin because it provides a couple of rules that allow you to do this, to detect when uh, there is no convergence within dependencies, though, so they will result in a build failure or when you want to make sure that you always select the, uh, <clears throat> the what would be seen as the latest version of the uh, upper bounds. Now, if we want to fix the problem with this pump, here's one way you can do it. You can use the dependency management block and say, it doesn't matter which version is coming in transitive closure from truth or juice. It doesn't matter in which order you define either of those. The dependency block says, if you encounter Guava with that group ID, an artifact ID, then the chosen version should be 28. And I can show you that actually working. And I have another project here. It's called, I think, a transitive tree. If we look at the POM file, the difference from the other one is that uh, it has a dependency management block. And this one has the latest version from Guava, I think it's 29. So remember, truth depends on 27. Juice depends on 25. If I do dependency tree here, then this chosen version for Guava is going to be version 29. And this is because of the dependency management block. Now you may define this block in your current POM, or you may define on a parent, or you may define it in the grandparent or anywhere else in your hierarchy. As long as it's somewhere in your hierarchy, then that value is going to be chosen. All right, so I mentioned the Maven Enforcer plugin, which provides a series of rules that will allow you to verify that your build is behaving in a certain way. You can also fail the build with something else not working properly. I find it funny at first, and I really like to uh, remark, <clears throat> the Enforcer plugin is the loving iron fist of Maven. Some of the behavior provided by Enforcer I, is my personal belief that should be included in core. It may be the case and I, this, I'm just looking at my big crystal ball that some of that behavior will be included in Maven 4. Now, I asked a question on Twitter a couple of months ago, I think oh, again in March, who uses the Maven Enforcer plugin? And turns out, not that many people use it. And that's a bit of a shame because it actually solves a lot of problems with dependency resolution, but not all of them. If you're interested in reading more about the quiz, uh, the URL for the quiz is right there. It's in, uh, on my personal blog. And then these are the results for um, how people did when answering everything. So the three bars in green represent the percentage of how many questions were answered correctly. Only seven people out of 509 got all 14 answers correct. If we split this the, the questionnaire in sections, the first section has six questions on just a regular POM file. The next section has four questions on a POM with a parent POM. And the last section had 
questions on a pump that consume a bomb file, a bill of materials. So the first question you can see that the, uh, the number of correct questions, correct answer was pretty low because many people thought this would be um, a bill error. And that the percentage of correct answers in the other section is a bit lower, which tells me that we have a bit, a bit of gaps in understanding how PAR and POMS files work and also BOM files. So this is another view. And uh, build error was always an option in all the uh, answers, but it was never a valid option. So those answers in gray shows you the percentages of how people thought that, well, this, this, this looks weird. Um, this is probably results in a build error, but actually none of them turn out to be a bill error. There are a few other issues that you may encounter with dependency resolution. I highly encourage you to have a look at this session by Ray Sink and Robert Schultz, the both of them Java champions, on how they solve different problems. The, uh, the fact that Maven does not resolve versions using a uh, semantic version is one of the topics that they cover, but a few others that they will, be, uh, they will exemplify and mystif they mystify in this particular session. So there's a link to the video, and uh, that link also has the link to the slides, if I'm not mistaken. I will also make available the slides uh, for everybody later. So next one, having clean stuff. Oh, this is a fun one. So how many of you, and that's inc myself included many years ago, whenever you build a Maven project, the first thing you do is Maven clean store, right? Or when we see a document or a readme file for a new project that relies on Maven, the first instruction that we see is Maven clean stop, right? Well, let me tell you, the first rule of Maven Club is you do not invoke Maven clean stop. The second rule is you definitely do not invoke a Maven clean stop. The third rule is you should use Maven verify. And if you're not happy with seeing Tyler Durden say that, well, what about this one? Maybe in Verify gives rainbows to your project. So what's going on here? Okay. So we know when you have a multi-project build, I mean, this works for single builds and multi-project builds, but it, 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 the, the impact is more apparent in a multi-project build because there are more stuff that needs to be built. So back in the days of Maven 2, we only built single project builds, but because projects grew in complexity, we needed to build more than one project at the same time. That's how Maven multi-project builds came to. And because it was not part of core, there was a project called the Maven Reactor plugin, which gave us this capability. That's why, I don't know why they pick up the name Reactor, but that's how it stuck. And it was so good that when the Maven team decided to, um, to push out Maven 3, they said, we should make Maven my multi-project builds part of a core. So let's bring in the information from Reactor, these learn lessons and put it into core. That's what we have it right there. So the install goal actually, well actually the install goal is not a goal, it's a flight cycle phase, which will allow um, plugins to hook into. And the install uh, life cycle phase happens to be the one that pushes the built artifacts to a repository, it happens to be the local repository. But it's also true that the install lifecycle phase executes after the verify phase. Now, if you do not need to uh, push these artifacts to uh, Maven local, that's better because you do not have to pay the price for IO copying files from one place to another. Another thing that also happened in Maven 3, which did not happen in Maven 2, is that the core is not aware of incremental builds. And plugins must opt in to uh, rely on this feature. If you, if you have a build that has all, all the plugins that you're using, that you're consuming, are incrementally built aware, then invoking clean will completely undo in anything in regards of incremental bits. So you will have to pay the price for computing everything again. So, um, so what we say now 
is that more often than not, instead of using Maven Clean Stall, just give it a try with Maven Verify. This should make your bills a little bit faster depending on the size. And most of the times it will do the right thing. There, I believe there are a few small use cases, corner cases that are not very common, where you will still need to do clean and where you will still need to do install. So remember, if you really need those artifacts in a Maven local repository, then you definitely want to use install. But if you do not, then verify is enough. And then you may be asking, Andres, uh, I in a multi-project build, I consume other projects, my siblings. I need those jars. So I need to install them into Maven local. No, that is not true. That's exactly one of the things that Maven Verify does. As part of, of all those projects are, are part of the reactor, then the built artifacts will also be exposed to every other project that actually requires them. So Robert had another session at DevOps Belgium 2019 explaining some of the history behind Maven 2 and some of the things that were changed from 2 to 3. And clean install and verify is one of those. So it actually feels like invoking Maven clean install is a little bit of a cargo code. Because back in the day from Maven 2, we definitely needed to install and clean all the time. But since Maven 3, we can do verify most of the time. Here's another neat trick. And this is coming from my, uh, this is something that I was looking for from my time that I spent in Gradle. So invoking Maven with dash AM and dash PL. This is pretty neat on a multi-project build. So we know now that Maven runs a multi-project build inside a reactor. Every goal that you set up in the command line will be executed for every single project in the reactor, which is good. So what happens if you have a big multi-project build Let's say 50, 100. I have seen Maven builds with more than 600 modules. And you only want to invoke a subset of the reactor. How do you do this? Well, if you pass the, the flag dash PL, PL stands for project list, you can pass a path or a series of paths separated by commas. And then Maven will only build those projects. But the trick is, as long as those projects do not have any other dependency between them. If they do, and if they depend on other siblings, you need to build a few more projects. If you want to build everything in a single session, again, using Verify instead of Clean Store, then you also need to specify the AM flag, which stands for also make. So let me show you a quick example of this. And uh, um, this will be the partial project number one. And uh, let's do a clean just to be sure that I don't have anything hidden. Okay. So the root project looks like this. Gap coordinates and four modules, one to four. Good. The four modules look like this. So there's project one, project two, project three, and project four. Let's look at the content of project one. It's a trivial project that only has a dependency to well defines its parent and defines the artifact ID, inherits everything for its parent, no dependencies. Let's look at two. As a reference to its parent, the name, and a dependency on project one. So it depends on a sibling. So far, so good. Project three, similar to project two, depends, uh, defines on the parent and depends on a sibling, project two. And let's see project four. I think that this does not depend on something else. Yes. So this is similar to project one. Now, when I do here at the top, Maven uh, compile. Actually, uh, yeah, let's do compile because we don't have any tests. This will be faster. We'll see at the beginning the information of the reactor, the build, which is the root project, and the four sub-projects. So Maven now is building everything. It goes to every project. So there's project one, there's project two, somewhere is project three, there's project four, and then the, re the summary of the reactor, everything is fine. Okay, 
I want to build project two only. Maven PL project two, and then let's do clean compile. Remember that project, oh, let's, let's start with project one. Let's start this. Let's build project one. It's built, perfect. Now let's build project two. And failure. And it says, I cannot find the jar file for project one. And this is probably the reason why many of us keep doing Maven clean store. Because, well, I need to find it. The only way that I can find it is to a repository. So yeah, right? Well, no, in this case, if I just add the dash am flag here, this will run a subset of a reactor, which we can see here at the beginning. This will be the reactor build, the build, project one and project two. And then the summary, and project two is working now. Is it that great? Excellent. Now, let me show you, I think it's project three, the sources. This is an executable class, okay? We know that project three depends on two, which depends on one, all right. And uh, being an executable class means that we should be able to do something like this, specify project tree. We want to compile, but we also want to execute that class. And we know that we can pass an inline plugin definition. We also know that we can define the parameter. In this case, it should be com acme main, if I'm not mistaken. And we should be running project three, right? Let's see what happens. Oh, oh no. The reactor order is fine, but the exec maven plugin says it cannot find come acme main on the build project. Hmm. What's going on here? Well, remember I said that Every goal that you invoke in a reactor is also invoked for every single project that is part of the reactor, which means that like Java will be executed for build, project one, project two, and project three. What we only need it in project three. Is there a way around this? Yes, it is possible. So now that we know that this Plugin, inline, if inline plugin or any that is explicitly defined in the palm will be executed for everybody in the reactor, then we can change the palm files in such a way that the exec maven plugin is defined for everybody, but disabled by default. And it's only enabled on the project that we actually need it. Sometimes this requires defining dummy values for some properties, some parameters for those projects that where the plugin will be disabled. What do I mean by this? So now let me change to another version of this project. I think it's called partial two. The, let's do a clean, so nothing is strange here. If we look at the parent pom file, now this looks different. I have two properties here, exec escape and main class. These are properties exposed by the exec plugin. Then I have a plugin management block where I say, I'm going to use the exec maven plugin. I'm going to say, if any of my projects or the build project and any sub module requires the use of the exec maven plugin, then these are the coordinates and I can have any additional configuration or default configuration. In this case, I don't need it. And then it applies the exec maven plugin, which means it's going to be uh, available to every single project that I build in my reactor, but because the exec skip property is set to true, then the execution of that plugin will be a skip by default. And notice that the main class value is some gibberish, some dummy value. The undefined class does not exist at all. It's just something that is not empty. If I look at project one, it should look exactly the same. Similarly, project two, project four, identical. Project three will look different. As this one, 
redefines the value for the main class, but also notice that it redefines the value for the skip parameter, explicitly saying false. This means I really want to execute exec maven here. So we execute the, we invoke the command line as we saw before. There's no need to do this because now we have a value. Let's see what happens now. One, two, three is the output. Notice that the reactor says, I'm going to build four projects out of five. So project four was a skip because it's not part of this sub reactor. Exec Maven plugin is a skip in build, a skip in project one, skip in project two, but executed in project three. So that's how we make it happen. Okay, next one. We kind of have seen this already, aggregating pumps. So an aggregating pump is a pump file that contains a module section. That's the only thing, that's the only requirement. They are typically conflated with a parent pump, but an aggregating pump cannot, could be something that is not a parent pump. Now notice also that the entries in module are actually path names. They are not artifact IDs. They are not project names. They're path that match to the file system. But because it is very common to find projects in directories that are immediately adjacent to the POM that uh, aggregates them, then we, we usually see names or paths are identical. But if you happen to have a, a very deep structure of pump files and there is nothing in between that you will see in the module that it will see different paths. Now, here's a structure of an aggregating pump, which I call build, where I have a couple of projects of so bomb and base. And these two projects, bomb and base, are completely independent from one another. They don't even share the same parent. But if I put this aggregating pump with, uh, and, um, having those two modules together, allows me to build those two modules at the same time. Now think of the following example, which is, um, I think I do have a demo for this one. Yeah. So let's, let's switch into, uh, is it multi? Uh, let's look there quickly here. This class, oh, there we go. So here's an example of paths. So subprojects are break one, two, and three. Why? Because subprojects doesn't have a POM file. Anyway, let's go one level up. I think is this one, BOM. This is a structure that I want to show. So let's do a clean here, just to be sure that nothing is there. Then let's look at this structure. I have two projects, base and bomb. Think for a moment, base is your project. And bomb is um, common slang or some other dependency. You found that there is a bug in one of these dependencies. Again, common slang. What can you do? First, you file a ticket. If it's not already a ticket existing for this particular bug and uh, hope for the team to fix this project and uh, so you can consume the dependency. Or you can try to fix it yourself. Now, these will typically require you to build the dependency, publish it to a Maven Central or your local uh, artifact repository. Check with your consumer project if it's working. If it's not, then continue the loop, right? But it will be much faster if that dependency will be part of the same multi-project build as your project. That's exactly what the aggregating pump is allowing me to do. Because if I do this here, say bum, and I showed you, this will be again, common slang. It's just a regular pump file and I can simply do maybe verify here and in both just this project, nothing else. Then I go into the base and let's look at this one. This does consume the pump, which will need to be available in a repository. I believe I don't have installed anywhere. So if I went to build this, it's going to fail. 
So if I just do Maven verify here, it's likely to fail. But if I go one level up, and notice that there is no parent definition here, nor here, right? Completely independent from one another. So if I'm at the root where I have the aggregating plum, and if I do verify, now I have a reactor, and I have built the two projects. So this will allow you to build things much faster instead of just pushing intermediate results into an artifact repository. All right. Next, we have bomb files. Now, bomb files have um, had uh, um, are now being used more and more in open source projects. So if you consume a Spring Boot, Quarkus, Micronaut, Jackson, GRPC, and so many other dependencies, all of them provide bomb files. So what is a bomb file? Basically, it's a pump that follows a certain convention. Uh, it has got coordinates. It may have a license, SCM. It may have a parent if you want to. But the most important thing that the bomb file should have is a dependencies man dependency management block. Because this says, I'm going to group a set of dependencies that go together. In this case, this bomb file is quite simple, it's trivial, it only has a single dependency, but if you were to pop open a Spring Boot bomb or Hibernate or the others that I mentioned, they have dozens and dozens of dependencies. Now, because of the virtue of dependency management block, if you were to choose Guava, it doesn't matter anywhere in your dependency graph, the choice version is going to be that one. Now, once you have defined a bomb file, again, with as many dependencies as needed, you will consume them in this way. You have to define a dependency management block in the consumer and put the, the, the coordinates for the POM file, so gap coordinates, but also two additional elements that are very important. First, the type of the dependency must be POM, because otherwise maybe we'll think that there is a jar file attached to this dependency, which is not, of course. There is no jar for this POM file. And the second thing is the scope. We have six scopes in Maven, and the sixth one, import, is the one that we must use here. So what happens when Maven sees these instructions is like, okay, I'm going to locate the bomb file based on those coordinates, download it, look into the dependency management block of that bomb file, and grab all those definitions and put it in the consumer as if they were defined in the consumer. So now that we have this, then I can consume Guava and just by defining the group ID and the artifact ID, and there's nothing else that I need to do because it just works as if it were defined on the project itself. Okay, I think this is everything that I wanted to show today. If you have any questions, please let me know. I, I must confess that I was one of those persons that thought that Maven was just a simple, dumb tool wrapped around with XML. Turns out that it really has a lot of features under, underneath. And there are a few things that, uh, that work really well. For example, invoking inline plugins in Maven is not possible in Core Gradle, but there is an option to make it happen. So I have written a series of blogs on entries on Maven, which is the first link. The second link is by a, a, a friend and fellow Java champion, Chandra Gunter, which has also has more, no, more in-depth knowledge on some inner workings for Maven. And if you're still working with Gradle, or are you happy with Maven, but so for some reason have to work with Gradle, and you're missing some of the nice features from Maven, then the third link will help you. This will provide you those features that Gradle does not have, but Maven does. I work for Oracle, so if I said anything about Oracle, if you make any purchases based on Oracle, don't believe anything that I said. You're safe. This is how you can tell an actually an Oracle employee. Safe harbor state. So with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, so now let's open the floor for any questions that you may have. Michael? Yeah, uh, we don't have any questions on the chat, but I do have one question for you. Okay. Um, I I know there is there used to be a company behind Maven. 
and uh, I forgot the name, but I, I think they stopped. I'm just wondering who is backing Maven. Is it like just personal contributions from people or is there like a company sponsoring people to work on Maven? Yes, a really, really good question. The, uh, the company name is called Sonotype. And uh, the, so Maven is an Apache project. And the Apache way is to have a healthy community, to build a healthy community where no single entity dominates the other project. Sonatype did dominate for a while. Now the um, the RCO people from Sonatype contributing to Maven, if I'm not mistaken. But the overall guidance of the project is done and is performed by volunteers. So Robert and Carl Heinz and Herbe and many others that contribute to Apache Maven do it on their free time. No one except for, as far as I can tell, I mean, I may be mistaken, but no one besides Sonatype members are paid to work explicitly on Maven all day long. So if you find any issues with Maven, I will certainly encourage you to reach out in the main list or in the issue tracker to let the Maven team, hey, this is not working, or maybe I misunderstood this, this uh, feature, or maybe there's some missing documentation. There are some, there's a series of issues in the issue tracker that have a label called up for grabs. These are issues that the Maven team has deemed easy to get started. So if you want to contribute to an open source project that has a big impact in our industry, this will be a right place to do it. Now, Maven continues to be the dominant build tool in the market. And it's surprising that a lot of people use it but there is no company behind it. There is no um, continuous support other than provided by volunteers. So if you can help in any way, we will certainly appreciate it. You can help by <clears throat> doing reviews, producing code, creating awareness of the tool, <clears throat> or if you can convince your company to do some sort of sponsorship. There are many ways to do this. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other question? Anybody would like to ask a question either on the chat or uh, by voice? I think we're good, Andres. Maybe before leaving, if you guys are okay, that's our tradition in the Java user group is just to do like a virtual group picture. So uh, everybody who is okay with it, if you can just turn, turn on your camera for one second, you take a picture just as a memory of this event. Okay. 